Universal is now beating Disney at its own game, and Epic Universe is going to be the nail in Disney's coffin. Hello everybody, welcome. Today we're going to talk about just how big Universal Orlando Resort is going to be once Epic Universe opens. And I'm going to show you definitive proof of just how bad things have gotten at Disney and how Epic Universe is poised to unseat the reigning theme park champion. There is no debating that Walt Disney World is the undisputed champion of the theme park industry and for decades has really defined what it is meant to be a world-class theme park experience. But before we get into the numbers and the data, I want to talk a little bit about how big Universal Orlando Resort is going to be now that they have Epic Universe. And I want to do a comparison of Universal Orlando Resort to Walt Disney World after Epic Universe opens, and I think you are gonna be shocked when you see these numbers. I really don't think anybody's ever done this. I've never seen this before. I've never seen anybody really do a in-depth comparison of the two theme park giants in Orlando. Just sort of a one-for-one -one comparison of all the entertainment and traction that they have. So this is gonna be a super fun episode. I can't wait, let's just jump right in. When you think about Walt Disney World, it is enormous. I mean, it just seems so big. They have so much land, so much space, so much entertainment, so many attractions, so many hotels. It just seems absolutely enormous in comparison to anything else. But is it really? Let's take all that land that they have away and let's talk specifically about the attractions and the entertainment. So the first park I wanna start with is Epcot. And though Epcot has a lot going for it, has the World Showcase, uh, which has all those different countries and things you can kind of look at, a little bit of little pockets of entertainment throughout some of those countries. When you really break it down to the big attractions, the things that people are really coming to the parks for, um, it's not quite as big as you think. Overall, they've got 11 big attractions at Epcot. Things like Frozen Ever After, you've got Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, Mission Space, Test Track, Journey Into Imagination, a bunch of iconic great attractions, but really only 11 things total. Switching over to Hollywood Studios, you've only got about 10 big attractions there in that park. Things like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, you've got Smuggler's Run, Rise of the Resistance, Rock and Roller Coaster, Tower of Terror, overall about 10 different attractions. Now Animal Kingdom has the least number of attractions. They do have a lot of animal exhibits, but when we look at attractions specifically, which is what most people really are going to the parks for, they've only got eight attractions at Animal Kingdom. Things like Avatar Flight of Passage, and you've got Dinosaur, Tough to be a Bug, and of course, Expedition Everest. So right now, we're only at about 29 attractions for all three of those parks combined. However, now we've got to add in Magic Kingdom, which Magic Kingdom is where the magic happens, appropriately named Magic Kingdom. In all, it has around 23 attractions. That's massive. Pretty much half of the attractions in all of Disney World are at Magic Kingdom. Things like Big Thunder Mountain, Tiana's Bayou Adventure, Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mountain, Tron, Winnie the Pooh, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. Joke, 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 joke. There's a lot of stuff in Magic Kingdom. And as we get a little bit later in this episode, we're going to show you how Magic Kingdom also accounts for a big chunk of their attendance. I mean, it is the park of parks. So all in all, 29 attractions if you don't include Magic Kingdom, but if you include Magic Kingdom, we're up to 52 attractions, which is quite a lot of attractions. Now, if I actually take out some of the lighter attractions, the things that, mm, they're just, eh, they're kind of okay, they're lighter attractions that aren't super interesting. Um, if you take some of those things out, we get down to about 40 attractions. And what I mean by the lighter attractions, things like Triceratops Spin, which by the way is going away anyway, uh, magic Carpets of Aladdin, some of the attractions that, you know, you're really not getting a lot out of. Most people don't really ride them when they go to the parks. Uh, so if you take those out, we get to, down to about 40 attractions total. But still, 52 or 40, either way, a lot of attractions. Let's switch over to Universal now because I want to do that comparison. Universal Studios by itself has 14 attractions. Things like the E.T. Adventure Ride, you've got The Mummy, you've got Rip Ride Rocket, Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts, 
you've got the Simpsons ride, Men in Black alien attack, so a bunch of different things, a lot of attractions at Universal Studios. Now let's switch over to Islands of Adventure. Islands of Adventure is almost as big as Magic Kingdom with 18 attractions. That's only five attractions short of Magic Kingdom. I'll be honest, I didn't even realize it had that many attractions till I actually started to put this list together. Because I was sitting there thinking like, it doesn't feel nearly as big. Magic Kingdom is so huge, there's so many different things there. But I was so shocked when I actually went through the numbers. Islands of Adventure, 18 attractions, only five short from Magic Kingdom, it's huge. Things like Hagrid's Magical Creatures, Motorbike Adventure, Velocicoaster, Jurassic Park River Adventure, Amazing Spider-Man, and The Incredible Hulk. So many awesome, iconic rides at Islands of Adventure. It just is an amazing park. Now let's talk about Epic Universe, which will be opening very soon. We're getting closer and closer, but it's bringing 11 new attractions to the table. And that's just at its opening day. There's tons of room for expansion, which we've talked about in other videos. Link, they're down in my description below. Just link to them if you want to know all the cool things from an expansion uh, perspective we're talking about, like the Creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, potential uh, water ride that's coming. So there's a lot of different things there. Check out those videos below. But 11 new attractions. Things like Starfall Racers, which is going to be a dueling coaster. Curse of the Werewolf, which was going to be a family-friendly spinning roller coaster. Monsters Unchained, the Frankenstein Experiment, which is going to be something that we've never seen before. Uh, think Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey on steroids. Like, crazy town awesome. Donkey Kong's Minecart, Madness Ride, Yoshi, Super Mario. I mean, there's just so many different things happening at this park. So now if you total up all those attractions across those three parks, we're up to 43 attractions, which is a massive number. So that's 43 total attractions versus Disney's 52. But now let's actually remove some of those smaller, less interesting attractions, things that you probably aren't going to do when you go to uh, the parks very often. Things like the Triceratops spin at Disney. That's going to bring us down to about 38 attractions for Universal. An example of some of those attractions is like the Carousel or the High in the Sky Seuss Trolley train ride experience. Removing some of those rides brings us down to about 38. So from a quick comparison standpoint, Disney, if you remove some of their smaller rides, Universal we remove some of theirs. Disney's at about 43 attractions and Universal's at 38. So only about a five attraction difference. Now, you could kind of debate those and which ones I took out and which ones I feel like are kind of throwaway attractions. Um, you could maybe give a little bit more to Disney or a little bit less to Universal or vice versa. It's really up to you. But the point is, there's not a huge difference. There's not even that massive of a difference if you don't take out any of the attractions. And if you do take out some of the smaller rides, that even closes the gap even further that the number of attractions that are like big e-ticket, interesting attractions, things that you're really going to see and going to experience over and over and over again, it's really actually pretty small. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, but Disney is much more kid friendly. They've got tons of kids attractions. That's what I hear all the time. People comment on my videos all the time when I'm talking about Universal and Epic Universal. Like, yeah, but, but Disney's got the kid market cornered. I'm not going to argue that. You're 100% right. They do have it cornered. Uh, but it's not as massive as you think. Disney currently has about 44 attractions total that either don't have a height requirement or have a height requirement of 40 inches or lower. They have about 44 attractions, which by the way is massive. And that's because so many of their attractions are also adult friendly. So they're not like Velocicoaster. They're things like Pirates of the Caribbean which doesn't have a height requirement. Like anybody can ride Pirates of the Caribbean. Universal only has about 28 attractions. So quite a bit less, 44 versus 28 attractions that are either no height requirement or 40 inches or less to ride. 28 attractions. Now you can look at both of those and go, yeah, but which one's better? Which one has more interesting rides for kids? You could debate that ad nauseum, but the point there being is, Disney still has a leg up when it comes to kid-friendly options, but Universal is definitely closing the gap. So pound for pound, when Epic Universe opens, it is going to be really close, uh, and depending on your preference of the types of rides that you like, Epic Universe adding to Universal, they're going to be about equal with Disney when it comes to attractions and entertainment. Now, you might have your favorites in Disney or Universal. Now, I'm not going to lie, 
Universal and Disney, they both have some bangers. They've got some straight up banger attractions. Disney's got things like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Still my favorite attraction of all time. I don't care. I know it's a Disney. It's a Disney one. It's not Universal. I don't, I don't care. Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, my favorite ride of all time. Right now. Something might replace it coming up soon, which I'm crossing my fingers. We'll find out. But right now, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. They've got Space Mountain, Tower of Terror, and Rise of the Resistance. I mean, they got some bangers. Universal's also got some killer attractions. Things like The Mummy, Velocicoaster, Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventures, Monsters Unchained, which is coming up with Epic Universe, and E.T. Yes, I said it. E.T. is straight up banger. I don't care what you say. And when it comes to water parks, Universal's got them beat. I know Disney's got two, Typhoon Lagoon and Blizzard Beach, but Volcano Bay crushes them both. I'm sorry, Volcano Bay, number one water park in the country that I'm aware of. Some folks have commented that there's some pretty cool water parks that I need to try that are outside of this area. So we haven't seen those yet, but at least in Orlando, Volcano Bay, I think crushes Disney's Typhoon Lagoon and Blizzard Beach both. So just looking at all the entertainment attractions, meet and greets, the shows, all those, Universal's got a ton of those as well. Disney has a ton of those. They're kind of equal-ish. I mean, I think overall Disney's gonna have a little bit more when it comes to meet and greets and character dining experiences. And they've also got characters that people want to see a little bit more than Universal does. So you could give them the edge in that space, but again, it's gonna be pretty close. But now I wanna talk about the proof. I want to talk about the proof, the data, the numbers. I'm a data guy. I love getting into data, spreadsheets, and statistics, and schematics, and all these things. I love getting into that. So we're going to break it down for you right now. Universal is on the rise. It's indisputable. They are on their way up. And Disney is on the decline. Disney is on their way down. I know a lot of people have been talking about this. It's a feeling that they get. They see kind of the empty parks right now. The parks at Disney are empty. We're in the we're in the middle of summer, which is one of their busiest times of year, and it, the parks have been empty. People were saying roughly maybe a 25% decline in attendance uh, over what they were expecting for this summer. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I want to look at the real data that shows it. So the first thing I want to look at is the volume of conversation and the interest that is being exhibited in social media and search channels, things that I've been doing. I did an analysis on all of that data. So let me throw up this graph. And what this graph is showing us here is four different parks that I looked at to see what the interest level and the volume of conversation that's happening around these particular parks. So the very top line there, the one at the very top, the dark blue line is Universal. Universal Studios, Universal Orlando. Um, that is that line representation of how much conversation, how much people are talking about these parks, how much searching is going on for these parks, people wanting to know more information, how much interest, how much general interest is there in this park. And you can see the blue line, the dark blue line at the top around Universal is number one. It's the top. And, and you can see some spikes and valleys. You can see it's a little bit seasonal. You can see some things there. Um, and those conversations are generally have been around. If you look into the data, the conversations have been around Halloween Horror Nights, of course. That's a big one that gets a lot of interest for Universal and Universal Studios. That big spike there at the end was around the Sensational Show and all the cool things that are happening with that. That's, that show is just phenomenal. And then a lot of chatter around the wizarding world of Harry Potter, uh, that gets a lot of volume bumps. So those are sort of the things that have, that have really just catapulted that particular line to the top. Right below that, the red line there is Epcot. So there are two big things driving that conversation. Um, that is, number one is the festivals. So anytime there's festivals, there's always spikes around festival conversation, booths and food and things that are going on with those, those festivals. The second one is all the construction, the whole Epcot reimagining, all you know, the Communicore building opening up, and, and the Journey of Water, Moana experience. And then right below that, the dark red line, that's Magic Kingdom. And that's primarily people talking about the meet and greets and the different experiences that you can have there, and then the happily ever after returning, all the, the, the general positivity and the excitement about happily ever after returning. And then the light blue line there at the very bottom is Epic Universe. So a lot of the chatter that's being driven around Epic Universe, the excitement for it, the things that are coming up, all the releases of content. And that park's not even open yet. The amount of conversation and interest in that park, and it's not even open yet, is just crazy. I mean, it's almost, you can see right there at the end of that chart, it's almost at the level of Magic Kingdom and the park's not even open yet. But more interesting than the volume 
are the trend lines. So if you look at the dotted lines that are going on that chart, that's the most interesting thing. So it's not just that there's more or less volume relatively, those dotted lines tell the story. So if you look at the Magic Kingdom and Epcot lines, they're almost flat. And I predict you're actually gonna start seeing the trend line go down over the next few months and the next year or two. In other words, the interest in Magic Kingdom and Epcot is staying about even, if not about to start declining. Now, if you look at the Universal trend lines and the Epic Universe trend lines, they're going up. They're going up quite steeply, I might add, not just a little bit rising. I mean, they're actually really making some traction. They're trending quite heavily in the upward direction. In other words, interest in Universal and Epic Universe is not only high, it is increasing. It's not slowing down. It's not flatlining. It is going up and up and up, and it is continuing to go up. But let's just take this analysis one step further. Let's talk about the sentiment of the conversation that's happening online. And what I mean by sentiment is, is are people talking about this positively? Or are they talking about these things negatively? Or is it sort of just neutral, undefined, uncategorizable conversation? If we take a look at Disney, the sentiment is 17% positive, 5% negative, and the rest, 78% is sort of neutral. And you think 17% positive? pretty good. Maybe you were kind of expecting the negative number to be a little bit higher based on all the things that have been going on lately. But still, 5% negative is a lot, especially when you think about Disney and being such an iconic, amazing company, 5% negativity is kind of high. But now let's look at Universal and see where they're at. Universal is at 38% positive. 38% with only 2% negative and the rest neutral. So 38% positive versus Disney. Disney was at 17% positive, 5% negative. Universal is at 38% positive, only 2% negative. That is a massive difference. That is more than double the amount of positive conversation from Universal than Disney. Now let's look at Epic Universe. What's the conversation around Epic Universe? 26% positive, only 3% negative, and the rest neutral. 26% versus Disney's 17%. And 3% negative. Now, the 3% negative, I will say, was mostly driven by the recent conversation around Epic Universe. When I dug into that, the recent negativity because of the tickets, the, the whole speculation around the tickets and what's going on with Epic Universe. If you haven't heard, check out my video. I've got a video below. You can learn all about the ticket packages and the, the lack of offering single tickets and having to purchase bundles and all that, which people are taking that as the only thing that Epic Universe is going to offer, which is incorrect. Incorrect. Watch my video. It, it, it lays all the details out. You'll learn all about it. But people are panicking and freaking out and thinking, oh my gosh, they're not going to do any single tickets. The only way I'm going to be able to go is to buy some big package. And so they're just not sure. And so they're angry about that or they're upset. So they're going, they're pouring that out online. So a lot of the negativity that even is around Epic Universe was just that. But either way, Universal, Epic Universe, much more positive than Disney. So let's take that a step farther and now look at the attendance. And this is where, surprisingly, all the data analysts and the data scientists or the wannabe data analysts out there, they get this information quite wrong. Because they look at the numbers in a silo and they look at numbers in a vacuum and they don't actually look at the big picture. So let's look at the latest attendance numbers from this past year. On the surface, Disney attendance, higher. They're getting more people at Disney than they are at Universal. 17 million at Magic Kingdom, 10 million at Epcot, 10 million at Hollywood Studios, 9 million at the Animal Kingdom. Universal Studios, 10 million. Islands of Adventure, 11 million. And I'm just gonna throw out the speculation. We don't know Epic Universe numbers yet, but I'm gonna assume Epic Universe is going to at least get as many people as Islands of Adventure. So I'm gonna say $11 million speculative, or 11 million people speculatively, probably is gonna end up being much higher than that, but let's just say 11 million same as Islands of Adventure. So at Disney, you've got 46 million in attendance total for their four parks. And for Universal, you're gonna end up with 32 million. So on the surface, Disney is getting more attendance than Universal. And like I said, on the surface, you might look at that and be like, there it is, there it is. Everything you just said makes no sense because Disney has more attendance. Disney's got way more people. Nope, 
you need to look at the big picture. What we wanna look at on this chart here is the trend. What we've gotta do is look at the numbers pre-COVID to the numbers now and make a comparison between those two. We're gonna sort of throw away those two numbers in the middle because that was during the COVID period and that's really not indicative of what the actual attendance is at these parks. So if we look at the pre-COVID numbers, that should be around when the parks were at their peak. Magic Kingdom was at about 20 million. And now in 2022, they were only at about 17 million in attendance for Magic Kingdom, which is where they really should have seen a return to their peak numbers. And let me tell you why. Because all of the attendance, all the spikes in traffic, all the money that Disney has been making has been because of one thing and one thing alone. And that is all of the pent up demand and the discretionary income that everyone had coming out of COVID. Lots of people were getting paychecks. Some people weren't, but a lot of people were still getting paychecks working from home, but weren't allowed to go out and spend their money. A lot of people got stimulus checks to help them survive, but also some people had enough money to survive and they were getting stimulus checks, basically was just padding their income. And so they've had all this discretionary income that they haven't been able to spend for a long period of time because of COVID. And I've said it since the beginning. I said it during COVID. I said it right after COVID. When Bob Paycheck was introducing all these things like taking away free parking and ripping away the Magical Express and making us pay for fast passes with this with the Genie Plus, and people were saying, well, see, people were willing to pay it. See, uh, Disney is right. They, they look at the numbers. Everyone's coming. Disney's packed and nobody cares. Everybody's willing to spend more money. But I've been saying it and I've been predicting it for a long time now that that was a temporary bubble that that was a temporary space and time where a lot of people had extra money and they were willing to blow it on these big, extravagant, expensive vacations and they were willing to overlook the price increases at Disney. Now that that bubble has burst, meaning everyone has blown all their discretionary money and now it's back to reality and we all have our nine to five jobs and we all have a certain amount of income and we don't have a pent up demand anymore and we can go other places like the Caribbean or we can go to, I don't know, New York or Manhattan or wherever you want a vacation. That pent up demand, that amount of money that people have doesn't exist anymore. So what you're seeing is the bubble has burst and now Disney is in a bad spot. All those changes they made, people are tired of. All those changes they made and increases in prices, people are upset about. They don't have the money to blow on that anymore. So now here we are, where Disney should be back at peak attendance, they're still at a negative 18% attendance. Not saying that their attendance is bad, but they're still in the negative significantly from where they should have been. You look at Epcot, the story's the same, 20% negative. Negative 20% where they should be. Hollywood Studios has taken the least brunt with only negative 5%. Animal Kingdom, negative 35%. Even Disneyland, negative 10%. So, and this is the way it is across the country. You look at Tokyo, you look at all the other Disney parks, Disneyland Paris, you look at all the parks, they're all in the red, they're all in the negative. They have yet to recover to get back to peak volume. And to a certain extent, this has kind of been Disney's plan. They actually want less people at the parks uh, because they want more money. They want less people, but they want to charge more. But it's still not where it needs to be. But it is a totally different story when you look at Universal and you look at Islands of Adventure, their numbers, totally different story. Let's start out with Universal Studios. You can see Universal is only at negative 2%. Now they are still in the negative, but only a negative 2%, which means they've almost pretty much recovered. Almost recovered. And I expect to see those numbers even better when the new 2023 numbers come out. We're still waiting for that report. It's not out yet, but we're, I'm expecting that, that to be even closer of a gap or maybe even, even into the positive. And then you look at Islands of Adventure, it's the only positive one on this list. Islands of Adventure plus 6%. They've more than recovered. They've recovered and then they've surpassed. So when you look at these numbers, when you look at all the stuff I just talked about, everything is trending in the wrong direction for Disney and in the right direction for Universal. For Disney, interest in them is down. Sentiment is down. Attendance, down. Universal, the exact opposite. Everything is up. And the most important thing I wanna say on this video is that momentum has shifted in Universal's favor. Universal now has the momentum. 
They have the momentum with Universal, Islands of Adventure, Volcano Bay, and Epic Universe. Halloween Horror Nights, everything, they've got the momentum and they are riding it. I mean, they're riding that train off into the sunset. And the problem with momentum is once you lose momentum, it is really hard to turn that ship around. It's really hard to get the momentum back. Ask any sports team that has the momentum and then loses the momentum what ends up happening. It's really hard to succeed and win the game if you lose the momentum. So overall, it does not look good for Disney. Um, I really, I don't even know, I don't know that they can turn it around at this point. Um, I keep saying that I really, I, they, I need them to turn it around, I need them to step up, I need them to, to get back to the, to the good old Disney, the old days. I don't know, I think even if they did, I don't know that they can turn it around at this point. So Universal really is on the cusp of, of taking Disney down, of taking, uh, taking the lead and becoming the theme park champion. And uh, I gotta say it, I think Epic Universe is gonna be the nail in the coffin. So overall, that's all I've got for you. Let me know what you think. If you are on the same page as me, do you think Disney can turn it around? Um, do you think I'm crazy? Let me know what you think of the numbers. This is the stuff that I pulled, this data. I'm, I'm a data guy, I love getting into it. So I'm um, perfectly happy to have you dispute the numbers. Let me know what you find. If you're a data person too, and you love digging in, send them my way because I'll use it in future videos. Uh, overall, again, I still love Disney. I'm still, I'm still in their corner, but uh, I just don't know if they can turn it around at this point. I don't know if they can pull it back. D23 Expo is coming up, so we'll find out all their amazing plans very soon. And maybe some excitement. They need a little bit of excitement and some buzz around Disney. And they need to get people starting to have faith in them again that they're actually going to do the things that they say they're going to do. Because no manner of excitement is going to turn any sort of momentum in their favor if they don't actually deliver on it. So let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks so much for joining us. Like, subscribe, share. Until we see you next time, the noble way is the easy way. Bye-bye, everybody.